Hello booktube, it's Eleanor here. Today I'm doing a, a bit of a different video for me. I am, um, I was trying to think about my five star reads and I'd seen a few people talking about the five star reads they'd read so far this year and I thought, oh, I'm interested to see what five star reads I've read but I don't really wanna just make a video talking about, um, you know, my five star reads so far. Um, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if I looked up what my five star reads were this year and then I used um, the themes and the ideas of those books to then pick a, a TBR so I can then hopefully find another five star read because there must have been aspects of those books that I enjoyed and I tried to pick out those aspects and then help them inform me picking uh, my TBR. Um, so I'm filming this now and then I'll tell you uh, the books that I read that I gave five stars, the book that I am going to read that I hope to give five stars and then at the end of this video I will um, do a wrap up. I will have read these books so um, uh, this is <laughs> hopefully not too far in the future but I would have read those books and I'll be able to tell you um, whether they did hit the mark like the uh, books that I'd originally given five stars. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, the first book um, that I gave five stars this year is called In at the Deep End by Kate Davis. Um, I have made a full review video of this book so I'll leave it linked up here for you if you want to go and find out my uh, in-depth thoughts on this. Um, but the three main points that I discovered about this book were that it had an LGBTQIA plus theme, it was really really funny and it was a little bit smutty and adult. So they were the three sort of main draws of this book and so I set myself the task of firstly trying to find a book on my shelf and if I couldn't to then find one that had those themes that I hoped to give five stars. Well I do have one on my shelf um, and I also have one that I want to read so I'm, you'll have to wait and find out at the end of this which one I end up reading. Um, but the one I have on my shelf is called A Love Story for Bewildered Girls by Emma Morgan. So this is the book following uh, three women and uh, various different things that happen. There is the forever single uh, woman who is the envy of all of her married friends who have children um, and she goes to a party and meets the woman of her dreams and there is a woman who is also at the party who meets um, a man of her dreams or I think um, and then there is another woman who is discovering that she is attracted to women for the first time. It's meant to be very funny. Um, I don't know much about it it's got mixed reviews and ratings um, but this is a contender for that it hits all of the different marks um, in terms of what I was looking for the other book that I discovered had similar vibes to this one is called popcorn love by KL Hughes um, I found this one by doing a bit of a search for the different aspects that I was looking for and this sounds like it might be a really fun read and it's got really good ratings it's about a woman, she's really high up in the fashion industry, she's a single mother and um, she's not really sort of put herself out there in terms of the dating world. Um, she manages to sort of convince herself that she's going to go on this string of blind dates and go out there and just try dating again um, but she needs someone to look after her son um, and she convinces um, or she finds this senior um, at university to come and uh, look after her son for her. She proceeds to go on these dates and I believe she probably comes back and then chats to um, this woman about these dates and she starts to realise that maybe she's having more fun after the dates than she is on the dates and uh, yeah I don't know much more about it but it, it seems to fit the bill so that is also an option um, uh, out of the two books I will be picking one of those. Another book that I loved and gave five stars was Death at SeaWorld. I've also made a full review video of this and I'll link it up here as well. This is a non-fiction story looking at SeaWorld and specifically their their orca program and looking at sort of the things that maybe we don't know and aren't aware of and learning more about orcas and their lives in captivity and how it is different from their life in the wild. I loved this book, it was quite an emotional read and the three points that I've put down for this is it's non-fiction, um, animal sort of nature writing and a bit of an expose. When I looked on my shelf there's one glaringly obvious book to pick and I debated not because it's 
on a similar well it's on the same type of theme but I thought no I'm not going to um sort of be put off by that I'm picking this one and that is Beneath the Surface by John Hargrove. John Hargrove was a SeaWorld orca trainer and it's his story of his time working at SeaWorld and his own personal experience it says he spent 14 years as a SeaWorld trainer um so it is very much along the same vein as Death at SeaWorld I believe he's probably going to be um pro um release of orcas um but i'd be very interested to get sort of a more first-hand um, account of working with these orcas and exactly what happens at SeaWorld. another book that i gave five stars was only love can break your heart by katherine weber i really enjoyed this um ya story um with sort of a love element to it but also this sort of exploration of grief and the three main points that i've pulled from this are that it was ya it was a tearjerker and um that it had a setting that was somewhere interesting to me somewhere hot or somewhere beautiful um so that does open up quite a lot of options um but i've managed to narrow it down to uh just the one and so the book that i am planning on picking up is a Heart in a Body in the World uh, by Deb Coletti. This book has um, all sorts of people giving it five stars. It's had a massively um, good reception. It's got great Goodreads ratings. It is following um, sort of a tearjerker, well, lots of people say they cry, so there is sort of a tearjerker element. It is YA, and um, I believe that the setting is quite interesting because it is a woman who is going from Seattle, Seattle to Washington um, running through all sorts of different landscapes so there is a very nice and interesting setting as well the next book I gave five stars is In an Absent Dream by Shauna Maguire I just love her um uh, series uh, of wayward children series which includes every heart a doorway and i wanted something similar and um, the points i pulled for this that was that it's fantasy and um, it's sort of children centric adventure i like the idea of sort of the portal fantasy children going to another um place um, so I've got two options both by the same author for this one I have and one I haven't got and I haven't decided which one I'm going to go for yet the first um, book is The Glass Town Game by Catherine M Valenti this is exactly what it says on the tin um, it is a sort of portal type adventure it's set in a small Yorkshire town um, some children go off to boarding school um, but then this train whisks them off to this sort of glass town which is um, a make-believe Thing that they had made up um she's also written a book which may be closer to the points that i've thought of which is the girl who circumvented fairyland in a ship of her own making so um one of these will be the one that i pick for that but both fit the bill in terms of the criteria that i'm looking for the next one may feel like a bit of a cheat but again I don't think it is because we're looking for five star reads um, I recently read The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte and oh my god I fell in love um, I fell in love with this book it's one of my favourite classics now I really really enjoyed the experience of reading it um, and the points that I pulled up about this that I liked it was a classic it was Victorian literature and it was woman focused on sort of equality um, uh, of women and so I just I can't help myself I'm picking up Agnes Grey um, also by Anne Bronte it has similar um, feelings to it um, it's about a um, Agnes Grey who works as a governess um, to assert her independence so it's got that sort of women's idea it's Victorian it's a um, classic so I'm going to pick up this one and then finally I mean how could I not include To Kill a Mockingbird um, not the original this time but the illustrated edition the graphic novel that I picked up recently and thoroughly enjoyed and gave it five stars um, and so the points and the criteria I pulled from that was that it's about race and class it's set in the deep south and it's set in the 1930s I looked for books on my shelf with sort of similar ideas um, and the one that I want to pick up is Dorothy Allison's ba Bastard Out of Carolina this isn't set in the 30s but it's set in the 50s so it's still set in the past and it is set in the deep south 
um, and it sort of looks I'm not sure if it is um, necessarily about race but it looks at family and power um, and what it was like living in the south in the 1950s and so I think that fits the bill for criteria so that gives me um, those books for my TBR I'm gonna go away now I'm gonna read them as I read them I'm gonna feed back and hopefully I'm gonna come up with all five stars because they fit into a similar mold to the five stars that I've read already but we shall see and uh, yeah uh, keep watching if you want to find out my thoughts um, and whether any of these were five stars fingers crossed fingers crossed I need some more Okay, so I've just finished my first book, which is Beneath the Surface by John Hargrave. Um, this tells the story of um, SeaWorld and its orca trainers and orcas in captivity. And John Hargrave was a, um, sorry, Hargrove was a senior um, SeaWorld orca trainer. He worked for SeaWorld for a number of years um, and left in 2012. And um, so this is his story. So it differs a little bit from Death at SeaWorld, which is written more from um, a perspective of um, advocates for freeing orcas and there's a lot more of a scientific aspect to it. This is looking at John, his um, relationship with the orcas, why he got into orca training, how he got into orca training, what goes into orca training. Um, and I really wanted to see um, from his perspective, because I know that he is now an advocate of releasing the orcas into sea pens. So I wanted to know what had changed his mind and um, seeing SeaWorld from an insider's perspective is quite a rare treat. So this book was released after Death of SeaWorld and the Blackfish documentary, which John Hargrove played a part in. Um, he actually played a part in um, and was interviewed during the Blackfish documentary, which um, happened after he'd left SeaWorld. I think the one chapter in here that is going to um, just continue to stick with me forever and ever is the one about artificial insemination. Um, how they artificially inseminate the orcas in order for them to um, breed and for their breeding program. I just found that really distasteful and really difficult to um, read and stomach and um, the process just seems really invasive and yeah it just um, really made my stomach turn. Another thing that really makes me sad is listening to John talk about the size of the enclosures for the orcas, how small they are in relation to the orcas' natural habitat, but even further than that, how um, dangerous they are for the orcas, how close they sometimes have to sit to the surface, which is damaging for their skin and for their, um, their fins, and... Uh, yeah, just how SeaWorld is this multi-billion dollar company. They um, changed the backdrops of their Shamu show to make it more spectacular continually and then they don't invest in the um, comfort and um, well-being of the orcas themselves, uh, which I just found just horrendous really and barbaric. John Hargrove gives a really heart-wrenching look into um, his life training orcas from a child where he became obsessed with um, becoming an orca trainer and to actually managing his whole life and everything that he did in order to be able to do this from um, practicing diving to deep depths from holding his breath for long um, periods and um, you know swimming training becoming the best swimmer he could um, dive training he took advice of trainers that were already there when he was a child and he followed them to a tee in order to um, stand himself in the best stead of becoming a trainer and then how when he became a trainer um, he just fell in love with these creatures and working with them and becoming um, sort of close with them and training them um, to then becoming quite disillusioned with um, SeaWorld and its practices and how the orcas were kept but feeling quite um, uh, helpless really in order to change it although he has been described by SeaWorld during various um, 
various times as being difficult which he explains as well yeah I was difficult because I was telling them that I wasn't happy with the things that were going on um, which I think makes perfect sense and although John left SeaWorld in 2012 it wasn't because um, unfortunately uh, because of the practices of SeaWorld it was more due to physical damage that working with the orcas had put on his Body, the toll that it takes to do all these different things and to do all these tricks underwater and working with the orcas um, and running around on these cement floors in bare feet had taken a massive toll on his body and it just wasn't something he could go back into. He'd um, he'd suffered from painkiller addiction which he had been um, sort of seeking help for and he just decided that he had to leave and he just felt terrible and I feel like had that not been the case perhaps he would still be working there still feeling upset about SeaWorld's practices but not being able to do anything about it and feeling like actually providing the orcas with the best that he can give given the tools he had would have been better than nothing. I mean it's quite clear to me from reading this book and Death at SeaWorld and watching Blackfish and reading more and more that these orcas just aren't meant to be in captivity. We can't provide them with something that mirrors their natural habitat. We can't provide them with the things that they need and it's just not fair. We are breaking up family groups and um, I mean thank God really that orcas are not allowed to be captured from the wild anymore and I believe that they've actually stopped um, any artificial insemination or breeding programs from happening now so um, hopefully this will be all of the orcas um, that will ever be in captivity but that doesn't help the orcas that are already there and I agree with John I feel like they should be um, if it is possible I mean I'm not a scientist I don't know these things but if it was a possible thing to do I think releasing them into these sea pens where they would, can be cared for in a more natural environment would be a much better situation for them. And I think SeaWorld has an opportunity. They have an opportunity to try and atone for the things that they've done by putting money into providing this. They could be seen as sort of atoning for their sins, as John said, by doing this, by spending their money in showing that they're giving back to the orcas that have made them so much. Anyway, I mean, it goes without saying that this ended up being a five star read for me. And so, uh, you know, tick uh, one book uh, to another. Uh, still a five star read so let's see if the next one is as fruitful okay since I last spoke to you I finished a couple more of these books um, so the first one I want to talk about is Popcorn Love by K.L. Hughes I found this one by doing some research into books similar to In at the Deep End this one was sort of said to be a fun romantic um, lesbian romance story um, so it sort of ticked the boxes in terms of being similar to In at the Deep End and I'm really pleased that I ended up picking up this one. Those comparisons really were correct, it was fun, it was um, light-hearted and it was raunchy as hell. The story centres around a single mum Eleanor, she is um, pa a powerful woman in the fashion industry and she is um, the mother to a young son Lucas and she is not really dating anyone, hasn't dated anyone for a few years, hasn't really been sort of focused on her dating life and her best friend Vivian has decided that that's got to change and has managed to convince her that she needs to start going out on some dates and that she will set her up on some blind dates. So Vivian arranges for a babysitter and um, this babysitter is called Alison, she finds her on Craigslist or whatever it is that you do, Gumtree or whatever, um, and she um, she's Alison, she is a university student or college student and um, she is uh, interested in the babysitting job and then she starts setting her up on blind dates. However, the first blind date goes spectacularly wrong, um, it's a terrible um, date and so um, Eleanor ends up coming home and sort of having a big old laugh about it and um, getting on really well with her babysitter. Now, Eleanor at the beginning of this story is has always, I think, identified as being heterosexual, um, but that's just because she um, she just hasn't really thought about anything else, I think. And she certainly, you know, when she's telling Vivian her ideas of what she's looking for, she hasn't ruled out dating women as well, so she's quite open. Um, you know, she's attracted to women, so she's open to, um, you know, seeing seeing both men and women and seeing who she likes. So I suppose by the end of this, or so, so maybe at the beginning, she is um, bisexual, but it's never, you know, ultimately stated her, um, 
her sexuality in those terms but um she starts to realize that she's enjoying her time with Alison more than she's enjoying her time on these dates and there is this sort of build up of tension and this sort of romance there um and you know a lot of it is was really fun and nice there were some elements that were looked into Alison was a foster child and so has never really known a family and has flitted from um house to house in her youth and with that comes some um you know some issues that she is um working through and also obviously there's lucas there's her young son to take into account and i really enjoyed how that part of it was really brought into this it wasn't like oh it's we're just going to focus on the romance they looked at the relationship between eleanor and lucas and allison and her relationship with lucas which i thought was good as well there's a real big family and friend input into this um from both sides and yeah i just thought this was really really good fun and actually the only reason why I felt like I couldn't give it five stars was um, Eleanor has this really bad habit of saying dear to everyone so she'll go oh not like that dear and not like this dear and I just really it's a pet peeve I really hate that I just find it it jars me like who says dear um maybe you do <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong but I just I've never heard anyone call anyone especially not someone who is young call someone who is also young that um and Eleanor sort of calls everybody dear which I find um a it, it grated on me and it jarred me and brought me out the story a little bit so that was really like my biggest pet peeve was that um I just caught, sort of couldn't get past that and it didn't just happen once it happened all the way through so that's why I couldn't give it five stars but it was a really really strong four stars and I definitely recommend this one if you like books with a bit of diversity um a bit of raunchiness and heat and uh, a steamy read then yeah I definitely think that this might be one that you'd enjoy and I'm pleased that I read it Next I picked up Agnes Grey uh, by Anne Bronte and I was really hoping that this would um, give me the same sort of feels as The Tenant of Wildfell Hall and in terms of the writing style it was definitely there like the writing style is very similar and I felt that that sort of drew me in um, but ultimately with this one it just didn't have the plot and story that I really enjoyed and that I don't think that that is necessarily the book's fault this is just a different type of book it's a quieter book we're following our main character who comes from sort of a middle class um family and she goes off to be a governess and we're following her life um as a governess to an array of spoilt and um you know badly brought up children and young people and so um sometimes there's just not a lot going on really so i think you know ultimately if this was Anne's chance to, to give us an insight into what it's like to be a sort of a governess and the sort of mundane mundanity of life then it does quite a good job um but there is sort of this sort of love interest in there and i just didn't buy it i didn't have any sort of um feeling that they were that enamored with each other and um yeah i just didn't get that connection there and i wanted um our main character to have a little bit more um enthusiasm for this um this love interest so yeah i just that bit fell flat for me so i ended up giving this one four stars and then the final one i want to talk about right now is the girl who circumvented Na uh, fairyland in a ship of her own making by Catherine m valenti and i read this one um because it had that sort of similar vibe i suppose as shauna mcguire's um wayward children's series and so i thought maybe this had that similar sort of style and in some ways it does but I think for me, um, my biggest problem with this one was it was just too whimsical for me. I mean, every word, there was something in there. Um, and it was just too upside down and inside out and roundabout and all the way round for me. And I think it was just too much bombarding me in one go for me personally. As I say, it just felt like there was, um, you know, in every sentence, a new fairy or a new um, person or a new character or a new fairy object or a new magical thing happening. And I just felt bombarded the whole time. Um, and it just, yeah, it just became a bit of a sensory overload, I think. The story follows September. She lives in Nebraska with her mother and father. And one day um, the green wind shows up with the leopard and whisks her away to um, fairyland. 
whilst in fairyland she goes on an adventure and I, yeah I wanted to like this more and on paper I really should have done um, but I think the writing style maybe wasn't for me as I say I just felt like there was a little bit too much going on I, I wasn't quite on board with the um, the sort of speaking directly to the reader that happens um, I didn't enjoy that quite so much and um, yeah I just think ultimately it just wasn't quite for me so um, I couldn't give this one more than three stars unfortunately so uh, I've still got a few more to go um, on this sort of challenge, but so far only one out of um, the four that I have read have ended up being five stars like, um, like the book that I've sort of tried to match them up with in terms of themes. So fingers crossed for the next ones. I think there's either two more, I think there's two more that I've got to read. I'll come back and let you know on those and then um, we'll see how terrible I am at picking books for myself and picking five star reads I suppose. Um, but I'll see you in a bit. Hi guys, okay so since I last spoke to you I've now finished the last two books. Uh, the first one was A Heart in the Body in the World and this is by Deb Coletti. I thought that this would be a good one because of its sort of contemporary, this emotional sort of hard hitting, looking at the sort of idea of grief and um, I really enjoyed it. I ended up crying at parts when I was reading this and normally for me if a book can sort of tap into those, emo those like really strong emotions um, it tends to end up being a five stars but there was um, there was just a few things that brought it down for me. The main thing being I found the start a bit slow to get into. Um, I sort of struggled at the beginning to um, keep focus and to want to keep reading and it wasn't until we were sort of 100 to 150 pages in that it really sort of got going for me and I started investing in the character. The book starts with Annabelle and she's running and she is decided that she's running from Seattle to Washington. Washington DC which is a heck of a long way and she just sort of starts running and she decides she's going to run sort of 16 miles every day we know that she's running for a reason but we don't really know what we know she's running to something in Washington DC but we don't really know what and that's really what this book is about so as um, Annabelle is running she is flashing back and we are seeing what has led up to this moment during this run she has a group of friends who set up like a GoFundMe page um, she's got quite a lot of family involvement from um, everyone in her family including her grandfather who comes in his RV and acts as her sort of pit stop every night he picks her up um, takes her off they have dinner together she sleeps in his RV and then he drops her back at the identical spot she picked her up from the next day for her to carry on and he follows and goes along with her for the whole of the journey. You don't find out till the very end um, the reason why she's running or that you don't sort of get to that point at the very end although there were a couple of points in the book where I feel they were a little bit heavy-handed um, sort of foreshadowing and um, I don't normally pick up on those things but I did so I think I felt like it was a little bit heavy there was just a couple of times where I thought now it may be that the author and um, planned for us to start thinking about um, what it was about at that point and maybe that was the plan all along but if it was meant to be sort of more of a big reveal at the end um, I feel like those bits that were in there maybe didn't need to be there at all okay I'm going to mention something here which is a trigger warning and if you don't want to be sort of spoiled for this sort of reveal in the book um, then um, stop the uh, video here or fast forward until you see me put my hand up like this okay so there's a trigger warning here for gun violence and violence towards women um, so I just think it's important to say in case that's something that you know really is triggering for you and in today's society Lord knows how many people have been affected by gun violence especially um, obviously in America because in the UK uh, gun violence is quite rare because we don't um, we, we're not allowed to buy guns um, so yeah um, just so you know that that is a trigger in here and that is um, you know one of the plot points so one of the things that I liked was that Annabelle is felt like a real character. She was very real, she was very natural. She didn't always make what I would consider the best choices, but I think that's what makes someone real. Not everyone is perfect all the time and not everyone reacts to things perfectly all the time and everyone goes through grief in their own way. And I feel that because of that, we feel like she is a much more relatable young woman and we're able to sort of root for her and follow along with her journey um and and tap into her emotions more because she feels real to us 
anyway I ended up giving this one a strong four stars but if I was doing half figures I'd say a four and a half stars so I was really pleased that I picked this one up and then the final book was A Bastard Out of Carolina by Dorothy Allison. I picked this up ages ago. In fact, I don't think I even picked it up. I think I was gifted it by the lovely Mercedes quite a few years ago now. I know that she read it and loved it. Um, this is sort of the one that is mirroring a little bit or was the prompt that um, I had a five star of To Kill a Mockingbird. This is set in South Carolina and Ruth Ann, or otherwise known as Bone, um, to all of her relatives, comes from the Boatwright family, which is a family of rough drinking too much um shooting at each other's trucks men and um women who get married too early and have children very young and age uh, before their time so at the start of the book it's become apparent that bone was born during a bit of a freak car accident where her mother was um gave birth whilst in sort of a coma um from the car accident and her grand uh, granny and sister um went and filled out all the forms for the birth certificate and left the father name unwritten making bone a bastard which is a bone of contention for her mother the whole way through the book um and yeah is something that she um, really, really hates to be reminded of. Early on in the book, her mother meets Glenn and Daddy Glenn becomes a big part in Bone and her sister's family um, and her mother's lives and um, becomes their father. Uh, but he doesn't treat her in the way he should and it involves violence and inappropriate behaviour and we feel for Bone. Bone is just going through so much. And <clears throat> this book really look, takes a look at mothers and daughters and family relationships and this really um heartbreaking relationship that bone has with her mother where she doesn't really know if her mother would pick her or Glenn. This was um, just made all the better for me by the narrator. Um, I listened to this as an audiobook. She did a, um, an amazing accent in my opinion and really managed to evoke the feelings behind the characters. Um, I just really enjoyed this and I couldn't put it down. It wasn't quite a five stars for me but a really strong four stars. So that's all the books. I've read the books that I thought. I didn't end up with as many five stars as I had hoped. I think there was only one in fact in there which was my non-fiction read but all the others were four stars and there was just one three star um, so this has gone pretty well for me although I do think it just shows that sometimes what I think might be a five star book for me isn't and I'm not so good at picking five star reads for myself so I'll just have to carry on, keep looking for those five stars and just surprise myself when they turn up. Um, but it's been a really fun thing to do and to try and pick those five stars out for myself. And uh, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed finding out a bit more about the books that I've read. Anyway, I'll speak to you soon. Bye for now, booktube.